Well, good evening. Here it is uh, Tuesday night again uh, with the uh, Amateur Radio Extra Class course. So we have at the moment 12 uh, students in our virtual classroom on Zoom uh, and a number of folks uh, on YouTube. Uh, welcome. We appreciate it. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, uh, we're using the American Radio Relay League um, Extra Class License Manual, the green uh, cover uh, the uh, 12th edition. Uh, they're available on Amazon and from the American Radio Relay League. And we're continuing tonight in Chapter 9, uh, which is Antennas and Feed Lines. And uh, so I uh, hope uh, that uh, you'll uh, stick with us and uh, we'll tell you what you need to know uh, to pass the Amateur Extra Class exam uh, to get your upgrade uh, in ham radio. Um, let's do a little housekeeping first. Uh, ben, if you would take my uh, laptop computer just for a second. I uh, want to show you here this uh, spreadsheet, this schedule. Here we are um, on uh, Chapter 9, Antennas and Feed Lines Part 2 tonight. Uh, it is the 19th of January. Uh, next week, uh, Dave is going to cover topics and radio propagation. Uh, he's going to do it all in one night. So. Um, um, make sure your brain is nice and cool when you come to class because he'll heat it up <laughs> considerably. Uh, the following week, February the 2nd, uh, we'll have safety during the first part of the class, chapter 11. Uh, and then the second half of the class, we'll actually take a practice test together uh, here uh, and uh, see how we do. So you'll, you'll get to actually take an exam uh, as a group here. Uh, you'll take it on your own. Um, you don't have to share your results. Um, and you'll see where you are, your strengths and weaknesses. And then finally, February 9th, that's what we'll do. Uh, we'll try to get two test sessions in, uh, in the, one in the first hour, the other in the second hour. With the extra class, it's a little more difficult because there's 50 questions. Uh, the other uh, um, technician and general is only 35 questions. So um, that's a little easier to fit in. So we'll do our best. Um, are there any questions about the up upcoming schedule? If so, just go ahead and unmute. So um, it is not too um, early to begin taking practice tests from wherever your, your source uh, of uh, practice tests is, whether it's the American Radio Relay League, Ben, you can come back to me, um, or um, uh, on your phone, uh, as long as you're using the current question pool. Uh, and then um, also be looking around as to where you're going to uh, take your test. Um, you may have an option available at a local ham club, uh, or you may actually go looking for an online session. Uh, I recommend you going, go to hamstudy.org stroke sessions. Hamstudy.org stroke sessions. I'll put it in an email. And um, you can then find uh, various sessions, whether they be online or local to you uh, at, at that location. So. Um, any questions about anything we've covered uh, so far uh, in the class, especially any material Dave has talked about? <laughs> Guess not. All right, so first off, I want to say thank you um, to a lot of people. Um, ben, you can come back to my PowerPoint. Um, thank you to the, the crew here, uh, to Dave Ivey, my uh, cohort, um, and to uh, the, the people who have uh, been supporting the channel for um, you know, a, a, quite a while, uh, it's been a ride. Uh, we started the YouTube channel on June the 10th, 2017. Uh, we'd been teaching ham radio classes for about a year or two before that. I don't know the exact date. Um, and we started the YouTube channel as a way for our local students in Greer, South Carolina to, to catch up on missed classes. Well, that was 2017. A couple years later, we were up to 3,000 subscribers on the channel. And I thought, whoa, what happened? You know, but um, okay, here we are, 2021. And yesterday, we crossed the threshold, 10,000 subscribers to the channel. Um, amazing. <laughs> and um, so, Two things. Yes, this is approximately how much we make from the ads that run on the channel, about $150 a month. Uh, that money comes to us and we put it in an account and we use it to buy equipment uh, necessary to produce uh, the programs. So that, that's helpful. Um, and um, uh, we have, you know, 
ideas, uh, and now we have some money to, to implement those ideas. Also, I want to show something that I'm kind of upset about, <laughs> but this has been this way for over a year now. Notice the top videos on my channel in the last 48 hours. Notice which the top video is Morse code class number one. Taught by Mel Robinson, KN4GB. Mel has had the top video on my channel for over a year. It's not even his channel. <laughs> anyway, if you want to consider learning Morse code, uh, I highly recommend uh, that to you. Um, if you would like to consider donating to uh, help our effort, uh, of course, our classes will always be free. Uh, it's the ham spirit. But if you would like to make a donation, I have a website w4eey.com and there is a donate button right there in the middle and uh, so if you'd like to uh, send some money along we would greatly appreciate it any money's received get put right back into the channel to, to make things uh, work a little bit better so 10,000 subscribers I, I couldn't be prouder and I want to thank everyone who watches on YouTube and uh, of course all of our students uh, who participated either in the classroom or, or here uh, virtually it's it's a really cool thing for us all right. Gary? Yes, Bill. Is that when you said 10,000 viewers and you monetized it to a certain number of dollars per month, is that a, a formula for everybody? Like if somebody's doing a show on the uh, I don't automobile? Know. I'm not really sure. I'm, I mean, you can see there are people who talk uh, about how much money they make and some, somebody, if they get a million viewers to a particular video. Um, um, I don't know. I know people they, have made really big money. Uh, from YouTube, well, not us. <laughs> but, but there are a couple of people who have two and three million followers. And oh, I'm yeah. Just curious, are they are they getting yeah. rich from that? Is that They're, so? It's a big business. It, it's a, they it's usually a full time have job. Five guys now in production working for you know it's a business. Yeah, it can be. It can be. So uh, anyway, uh, didn't want to go off on that tangent. But anyway, happy to to share the info. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to to email me. We'll, we'll talk about them. So let's continue section nine point three uh, in uh, chapter nine antenna systems, uh, and we need to be concerned not only with the the antennas but everything that's in the way or any everything that's part of the chain. So here's our transmitter or transceiver. Um, if there's maybe a, a low pass filter of some kind to try to reduce harmonic output, there might be an SWR meter. Uh, there might be a filter uh, here as well. There might be an antenna tuning unit. There's of course a coax or open wire feeder line uh, and your antenna. So, Everything from the transmitter's RF output is part of your transmission system. And when we're transmitting, we want to have impedance matching. We want to have the output impedance of the transmitter match the uh, impedance of our uh, transmission line, uh, match the antenna, or at least make the transmitter happy uh, using an antenna tuning unit. Why do we do impedance matching? Well, for the maximum transfer of power. Uh, if you've got a 100 watt transceiver, you'd like 100 watts to reach the antenna. And that's not always the case. This is a, a representation, a graphical representation of a matched impedance. If you've got all the power coming from the left, going out to the load on the right, and you see, hey, it's, it's all going and, and just being radiated out uh, and a very strong signal. On the other hand, if you have an open circuit, um, all of your power is going to be reflected. This is 100% reflected power. Well, neither of us, uh, uh, neither of these uh, cases are, are likely in our, our station. What's more likely is something like this, a partial reflection, uh, where the antenna is close to being matched to the transmission line, but there might be a slight mismatch, and so some energy is being sent back uh, to the transceiver. And this is the case where an antenna tuner uh, back at the uh, transceiver would be able to re-reflect that reflected wave back out to the antenna uh, for another chance. Is, is there a number associated with that? Is that less than three to one or less we'll, than We'll talk one? about that. We're, we're going to get into okay. that. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I showed you earlier hitting an open circuit. Um, that's the top up here. Uh, you see the energy coming out and all of the energy is being rebounded. This is true. On a short circuit, if you're going out and instead of having an open, you have a short circuit, 
the same amount of energy comes back, but the polarity is reversed. So here's an open and a shorted circuit. Uh, another way to look at this is to look at waves, the radio waves going from the left to the right is from the transmitter to the load. So that's represented by the, the blue. Um, and the reflected wave is represented by the red. And where they add together, you'll see the peaks forming here. Uh, and this black line that you're seeing there doesn't move. That's a standing wave. So what we're trying to do is to get that standing wave down to nothing. Because in, in the case of all of the energy going from the left to the right and none coming back, then you would not have a standing wave. So just a graphical look um, at some of the conditions that might exist on your transmission line. So now we're going to go back to school, back to the basics. We're going to learn our ABCs. Well, almost. Different. ABCs. Greek. So anyone know what this one is? Delta. This is the Greek letter delta and it has to do, we, we talked about impedance matching, trying to get the maximum amount of output power. And so a delta match can be used at an antenna. And so here is a half wave dipole antenna um, and I've drawn the delta upside down here to, to kind of more closely correspond to this. So here's a half wave dipole antenna. Notice that it's not open in the middle, it's connected. All right. And here we have 600 ohm transmission line. Well, we know that at the center of a dipole antenna, the nominal impedance is about 73 ohms. So if we go outward from that center point, we'll come to a point that matches 600 ohms. And so the, the dimensions of the delta in feet are calculated using these formulas here. This is our familiar half wave dipole formula, 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. And then uh, A and B can also be determined in feet using these formulas. So this is a delta match. For those in the metric system, here are the formulas uh, in meters. So you can uh, build the uh, the system if, you, if you're used to meters. So that is a delta match. That's one of the things you need to know. Uh, and remember that you're coming from a high impedance transmission line, high impedance feed line, to a lower impedance antenna. Remember the center is 73 ohms. So 600, we're matching uh, to that. All right. Here is the Greek letter gamma. And gammas are, gamma matches are very popular on Yagi antennas. Um, it's an unbalanced to balanced system. Uh, so, and it uses, here's coaxial cable, which is unbalanced. Um, and a gamma match will step up the impedance. The shield, again, is connected right at the center of the driven element. There's no opening there. So the driven element, uh, again, a half wave dipole. Uh, the ground is right there at the center. And you match using um, this uh, inductor bar and this capacitor here. The capacitance cancels the inductance and, and gives you a, a good transformation. Here's a schematic representation of a gamma match. And so gamma matches are used on many Yagi uh, antennas. Also, a gamma match is used, people ask me sometimes, Gary, I've got this tall tower. Can I use it as an antenna? And the answer is yes. By gamma matching from a low impedance feed line, 50 ohm feed line, um, with a capacitor that's variable uh, usually, uh, that goes up to a certain point on the tower, you can cancel the inductance of this line with the capacitor, and yes, you can load energy directly into the tower itself. So gamma matches are used for um, shunt feeding a tower. That's what it's also called. This works uh, very well as a transmit antenna for 160 meters and, and 80 meters. Omega, uh, we use it as a symbol for ohms, but it's also a kind of antenna match. Uh, it adds an L network uh, uh, ahead um, and it uh, matches only loads with a radiation resistance lower than the feed line impedance. Um, 
there are no questions on the test about an Omega match, but I wanted to make sure that you knew it existed. So here's a comparison, the delta, the gamma, here's the delta again. Here's something called a T match, which is like two uh, gamma matches using balanced line. And then finally, the omega match. And the whole reason we do this matching is to make sure that there's no reflections of the energy coming back from the antenna uh, and that the standing wave ratio uh, is reduced to one to one, if at all possible. Another way you can match is called stub matching. And you can use open or shorted transmission line added to a point uh, along the main transmission line. And with the right length of transmission line at the right point, you can get a perfect match at one frequency. Uh, and you can actually uh, operate plus or minus uh, a few kilohertz from that frequency, depending on the band you're operating in. So this is stub matching. Uh, and well, Gary, how do I know where to put that stub? Well, that's what a Smith chart can tell you. And we're going to talk a lot more about Smith charts here in, in just a little bit. They talk about also in the book something called universal stub matching. And this, if you're out in the field and, and you've got a match to a VHF or UHF antenna um, and, and you, you see that there's a bunch of reflected power coming back, but you have no idea what the feed point impedance of that antenna is, what you can do is just hook up a random length of uh, feed line uh, and just move this up and down along that feed line and find a point at which you get a match. Uh, this is going to be a, a pretty reasonable length for uh, 2 meters or, or 70 centimeters. Um, so they're not hard to build and it can be an open stub or it can be a, a shorted stub. So it's practical for VHF and UHF due to the manageable stub size. So this is universal stub matching. Some commercial uh, Yagi antennas will purposely uh, have their driven element, the half-wave dipole, slightly shorter uh, than the calculations would uh, tell you. Why do they do that? They make it capacitive. Uh, and by making that driven element capacitive and then using this, which is called a hairpin match, in this case the dipole is split in the middle. There's no continuity between the two sides. Um, this look, would look like a short circuit at DC, but at radio frequencies it's not. It acts as an inductor. And so by having a capacitive um, driven element and this inductance added to it, the inductance will cancel out the capacitance. And you can actually slide this hairpin in or out uh, of the mounting to make adjustments for impedance matching. So yeah. this, this is called a hairpin match. So in uh, measuring their transmission system, remember the transmission system is everything uh, that's in the system, we uh, want to take into account um, losses and gains. And there are a number of questions on the test that ask you to do this very thing. So we're concerned about, okay, what is the transmitter power output? And then we're going to have feed line that is going to be lossy to some extent, 1 dB, 2 dB, 3 dB maybe. Then we might have an antenna that has gain. So by putting all of these together, we can calculate something called the effective radiated power. So in this case, PEP output minus the feed line loss gives you the PEP power that's into the antenna. And we haven't done a lot uh, with calculations uh, of uh, um, decibels. You might remember seeing this formula in the book. And I'd like to go over to the calculator cam now and uh, just show you um, how this works. All right, so here we have our calculator. I'm going to turn it on. I'm just going to hit clear just to make sure that there's nothing in there. And if you have your uh, TI-36X Pro calculator, you might want to follow along. And remember, the nice thing about this calculator is you can put the equation in just like you see it uh, there on the screen. So it's 10 log the ratio of the powers. That's the formula. So 10 times, now here's the tricky part, 
finding, and it's log to the base 10. So up over here below the second key, the blue key, is a key marked lin log or ln, which is logarithms to uh, natural logarithms. If you hit it again, it's a multi tap key. Now it's a log to the base 10. So you remember we said that if we um, doubled power, we had a 3 dB increase. Remember we said that? Um, yeah. Or if we uh, quadrupled power, if we had a times 4, uh, then that was 6 dB. Well, let's, let's prove that. Let's see. So I'm going to put 2 over 1 would still be 2. So I'm going to put 2 in there. You don't have to close the parentheses. All you have to do is hit enter. And look, it's 3. So we just proved that by doubling the power, you get a 3 dB increase. Let's try that again for 6 dB. 10 times log to the base 10. So you have to push it twice. Now we're going to say the ratio is 4, and I'm predicting it should be 6 dB. Oh, look at that. 6.02. Okay, good, good. Well, what about, remember, 10 dB? That's 10 times. So let's prove that. 10 times, go to the uh, log to the base 10, 10, the ratio of 10 times the power, it should be 10 dB, it is, look at that. So you can do the, the math, you can actually do the math and come up with the calculations, and we'll do some of this here uh, in just a, a second, but I wanted to start uh, with that review, um, go back to the PowerPoint, please, and uh, show you the formula there, 10 times lo uh, log to the base 10 of the ratios. And this works also for um, losses, so you, you'll get a dB in it with a, a minus sign. So here's a sample problem. Well, let's see if we can do it. Uh, and here's our, our formula again. So what is the effective radiated power relative to a dipole, okay, of a repeater station with 200 watts transmitter output power, 4 dB line loss, 3.2 dB duplexer loss, 0.8 dB circulator loss, and 10 dB D antenna gain. So it's nice they put them in the same reference, referencing a dipole to a dipole. So that kind of drops out. It's not even part of the equation. So here we have our losses and our gains in the system. The 4 dB feed line loss, the 3.2 dB duplexer loss, the 0.8 dB circulator loss, they're negatives, and then we have 10 dB gain, that's a positive, and when you add these all up we have plus 2 dB um, of, uh, of gain. Uh, and so you can do it on your calculator, um, find out what um, uh, the, the 2dB equals, or you can look at a table. And the table here, uh, this is power on this side, forget about voltage dBs for the moment. 2dB is 1.58 increase. So 200 watts times 1.58 is 316 watts, and that's going to be the correct answer. Now, some of these we're going to be able to actually approximate and just kind of noodle out without having to do any calculations. Uh, so let's see. Oh, we're already at questions. Let's go see what we can do. Oh, here's one of these right away. So what is the effective radiated power relative to a dipole of a repeater station now with 150 watts output? Okay, it's got... 2 dB feed line loss, 2.2 dB duplexer loss, and 7 dB antenna gain. So what's minus 2, minus 2.2, and plus 7? The 420 watts. Well, okay, so it would be minus 2, minus 2.2, and... Um, um. And a plus 7, that gives you a 2.8 dB okay. gain, plus 2.8 right. dB. 
Two point eight is two pretty darn close six. to three, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So if we're starting out with one hundred and fifty watts, we're going to be pretty close to double that. Ah, look down there. Yep. So we didn't even have to get the calculator out for this one. You see how we got there? First, we find out yep. what the overall dB uh, of the transmission system is, so what gain or loss. So it's minus two. That's a loss. Minus two point two. That's a loss plus seven because it's a gain the resultant of minus two minus two point two and plus seven is plus two point eight very close to three so very close to twice whatever we started with very close so that's 286. what was the last button you hit on the calculator enter um it, for the uh, logarithm is that what you're looking at yeah yeah okay so let's go back to the calculator cam if we would so um, first clear your calculator. You want yeah. to type 10, because that's how the formula yeah. starts, times. And then it's right here below the blue button. You have to push it yeah. twice to get so it says log. See that? Yeah. And now if I go 2.8, because we ended up with a 2.8. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do DB. Um, that's not going to work. Um, you can hit clear, it'll go back yeah. one. Yeah. Um, there is another formula for converting dB to, to gain, but I'm, I'm trying to give you the shortcuts here tonight, <laughs> so okay. you don't have to do that. But I wanted to also have you be aware of the formula. So, right. So, let's not get confused. You're getting me confused. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. All right, let's go on to the next question, please. Oh, it's another one of these. All right. So we're starting with 200 watts. We have a 4 dB loss, a 3.2 dB loss, and a 0.8 dB loss, and a 10 dB antenna gain. So minus 4, minus 3.2, minus 0.8, and a plus 10 gives you a gain of plus 2 dB. Well, remember we looked at that table and we said 2 dB gain is 1.58 times the power. So 200 times 1.58 from that table tells us the right answer is 317. All right, one more, I think. All right, what is the affected isotropic radiated power of a repeater station with 200 watts 2 dB feed line loss, 2.8 dB duplexer loss, and 1.2 dB circulator loss, and a 7 dBi antenna gain. Thankfully, again, they're keeping apples and apples. They're talking about uh, effective isotropic radiated power, and they give us the dBi gain here, so there's no fancy shenanigans we have to do. So 2 dB loss, minus 2, minus 2.8, minus 1.2 and plus 7 gives us a 1 dB gain. And 1 dB is just about 20%. So starting with 200 watts, a 1 dB gain, which is about 20%, is going to put us at 252. So we didn't have to get the calculator out, is what I'm trying to say. There are ways around this by knowing these certain factors. You'll want to review these, I'm sure. So what term describes station output taking into account all gains and losses? Charlie? Charlie, the effective radiated oh. power, indeed. And what system matches a higher impedance transmission line to a lower impedance antenna by connecting the line to the driven element in two places, spaced a fraction of wavelength each side of the element center. And it looks like the Greek letter upside Delta. down. Delta. Delta, correct. And what is the name of an antenna matching system that matches an unbalanced feed line to an antenna by feeding the driven element both at the center of the element, the shield goes there, and at a fraction of a wavelength one side? Alpha. That is the gamma match, correct? Huh? Letter A. 
And what is the name of the matching system that uses a section of transmission line connected in parallel with the feed line at or near the feed point? The delta? No. You're adding um, a short section of transmission line connected in parallel with the feed line. Something that short might be said to be a stub. Oh, the... Yeah, that's a Charlie. stub match. No, it's... Oh, that's what, yeah, that's uh, what I meant when I said delta. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was looking up here. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. You were right. I was wrong. Um, I said earlier, I said delta, and the answer was bravo, but I meant delta. <laughs> <laughs> the delta one. match. So be careful when you're taking the test uh, that you keep yourself straight. Um, we've just maybe um, learned something there. Stub matching, by the way, is something we used to do all the time in Voice of America. Uh, because with a high power transmitting station, uh, we had open wire feed lines, really big pieces of copper uh, going out to uh, the antennas. And it was a matter of plumbing. Uh, you, you just clamp on a stub at a certain point move it back and forth and, and lengthen or shorten it, and then you'd find the match and then you're home free. So stub matching uh, with open wire lines is really easy to do and um, uh, very effective. All right, let's continue. What is the purpose of the series capacitor in a gamma type antenna matching network? Beta. Bravo, B, to cancel the inductive reactance of the matching network. Yeah, you, you, you want a resistive load. That's what you're trying to get. So if, you've, if you're adding a capacitor, there's got to be some inductance in there that you're canceling out. How much an, an, must, uh, how must an antenna's driven element be tuned to use a... Let me try this again. How must an antenna's driven element be tuned to use a hairpin matching system? There, I got it. Remember, I said that hairpin represents oh. at RF an inductor. Oh, uh, reactance at alpha. Yep. So the driven element must be capacitive. They'll cancel each other out and leave you just with a resistive a radiation resistance. So which of the following is used to shunt feed a grounded tower at its base? Remember, I said this was used in Yagi antennas and also used... To shunt, oh, the gamma match. shunt Charlie, feed a gamma. tower. That, that's a gamma match, correct, indeed. And which of the following is a common use for a Smith chart? Delta? No, I said we'd talk about this later. Um, but you wanted to know how, where do I put that stub and how long should it be? So that's, that's oh. the Smith chart. Um, yeah. Determine the length and position of an impedance matching stub. And these stubs, yeah. I talk about using it with the open wire line because that's the easiest. You can do it with coax as well. It's just harder because you're putting connectors on all the time. All right, let's continue on. Transmission lines. So antenna analyzers, their, their big claim to fame is that they have a built-in radio frequency source. They have a, a very low power transmitter built in, um, and you can use it to make a, a measurement at a single frequency, or you can start sweeping through a, the entire band, for example. Um, a lot of the antenna analyzers have an interface to your laptop, so you can actually uh, draw plots, uh, and um, or some even have Smith chart. Um, we'll talk more about those. You can get a direct readout of the radiation resistance and the reactance uh, at the position that you're measuring. Um, and it's portable. You can carry this up uh, to the top of a tower and make a measurement of an antenna up there. So there are a lot of advantages to an antenna analyzer. Um, and when you're connecting an antenna analyzer, you connect it either directly uh, as close as you can to the antenna or to the transmission line going to the antenna. Never, never, never run a transmitter into one of these things or you will let the smoke out and we all know what that does. 
Another way you can measure standing wave ratio is using a directional power meter. Um, this is a, a bird or a through line, a bunch of different people make them. Uh, they have slugs or little things that are stuck in the front here. Here's another slug that's being stored in a storage compartment on the side. You have slugs for different frequency ranges and different power levels. And you read the power on the meter in the direction that the arrow was pointing. So you connect the transmitter up here and the load over on a connector over on this side. And so here we're measuring forward power. And then if you rotate that slug so the arrow points in the opposite direction, you can then read the reflected power. And then on the back of the device there's a chart uh, that you can actually calculate standing wave ratio using a directional power meter. Not so handy to carry up um, uh, an antenna tower. So that's why analyzers are, are really nice. And when you're hooking them up, like I said, the, the directional watt meter goes from your transmitter. You have to have a, a transmitter generating RF out to the antenna. It's right there in between. Whereas an antenna analyzer, in this case, is connected up to a dummy load, but would be connected up to your transmission line or to an antenna. Got some big bucks. You might see one of these available at uh, your local ham fest. Here's a Hewlett Packard network analyzer, radio frequency network analyzer, and a companion. This is known as an S parameter test set. And with the two of these things, this guy is probably around $20,000 or thereabouts. This guy's probably around five to 10. I'm not sure what the current prices are. But here you put a device under test. One of them is a, a generator output and the other is a receiver input. And you can characterize a device under test. And you can have it plot, plotted uh, information in different ways. Here is a Smith chart, even on the network analyzer. Well, these are kind of out of the price range of most normal hams. But then hams themselves started manufacturing their own vector network analyzers. And this is one designed by a ham in Germany and uh, being sold by a firm in England. It's much more affordable. Uh, it's around $700, I think. Um, you can characterize components up to 1.3 gigahertz. Uh, it uses PC software that connects up via a U USB connection. Uh, there's an internal uh, radio frequency generator and uh, a low noise spectrum analyzer uh, built in. Uh, it will measure S parameters. We'll talk more about that. You can do VSWR plots of antennas and, and have a Smith chart display. One nice thing about this is it's very sensitive and low noise. Um, so it has a lot of, of working range, a lot of dynamic range. So this is oh, the, what are they, about $700? Roughly about $700. Uh, the company that sells them is SDR Kits uh, out of England. And when you get the uh, PDF, there'll be a working link down here. You can go take a look. Now. That's $700. And I wanted to buy one of these, but I could never really justify it. Well, here's something that anybody can justify. Here is the Nano VNA. The Chinese decided, hey, we're going to make one of these things. And so version 2, which goes up to 3 gigahertz, is about $100 on Amazon. Version 1 uh, Nano VNAs are still available. They're around $50. Uh, and there's a users group, I highly recommend, on groups.io for nano VNA users. Um, and if we can go back to the uh, calculator cam, here is, in its box, a nano VNA. Um, and it's not charged at the moment. Okay, C true confession time, I haven't used it yet. <laughs> it's just in the box. But it, uh, this is how they come. Uh, and it comes with these three special connectors. We're going to talk more about those uh, in a minute. It comes with a USB charging uh, cable, also to connect to your laptop. Um, so you can find these on Amazon. Just search for Nano VNA. Uh, and it's a way that you can characterize components uh, and also characterize antennas as well. So um, you, when they characterize, what would be synonym for that? Um, to know what the radiation resistance is and what the reactance is at a particular frequency. Um, so wow. you, you can calculate the, the SWR, um, or if you're trying to you know, make a matching network or to you know, compensate for that, uh, this little guy will, will tell you the components that you need to, to put in there. So, um, 
what, what, what possessed you to buy it? What, because you have so much equipment and you can solve almost any problem just by opening that drawer on your left. Why would you buy this? Well, because I went to a class uh, being taught in uh, Hendersonville. It was a one night seminar by uh, a ham up in the uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina ham club. Uh, and he gave a great presentation on um, how this uh, unit can be used. Uh, and there's actually some um, software that will interface to it that gives you a lot of really good information. Um, so I said, yeah, I think I want one of those. I just haven't had the time to play with it yet. Um, and that is one thing they say that once you get a vector network analyzer, your wife can say goodbye to you because wow. you, it, you so much fun to play with you play with it all the time so just yeah. just to yeah. let you know so those three There's little devices the that I, I showed you there on the left hand side those three little devices are used to calibrate the uh, vna um, and one of those, them is an open circuit one of them is a short circuit and one of them is a typically a 50 ohm load because we work in 50 ohm outputs for amateur radio and you go through a calibration procedure each time you use the VNA to make sure that it's calibrated properly and then the results that you get will actually mean something. So you can't use the VNA without calibrating it first. But it doesn't take very long. So what information can a VNA tell you? Well, it can tell you the input impedance of a device under test. It can tell you the output impedance. It can tell you uh, the reflection coefficient, which relates to standing wave ratio. And the VNA can give you information about, I mentioned this earlier, S parameters. It comes from optics. S stands for scattering. Uh, and it was a way for um, people working with glass or prisms or fiber optic cable or things like that to characterize the things that they were working on. Um, and so you can characterize device gain, um, return loss, VSWR, um, stability. The device under test, also abbreviated as DUT, D-U-T, um, is treated as a black box. You don't know what's inside of it. And you send it all sorts of frequencies and you see what comes out of it. And then you can characterize the device. Um, and so it uses something called S parameters. Uh, and the S and then the numbers after it indicate the ports where the signal can enter or leave a device under test. And so we, we want to know about two of these. So I've tried to make it simple. So we have here our footballer and forward gain. And oh, he's number 21. S21, when you know that parameter, then you know the forward gain of the device under test. Oh, there it is right there, the forward voltage gain. So that's S21, and go 10 notches down, and S11, here at desk 11, is the return loss, also known as the reflection coefficient. So the input port voltage reflection coefficient. And you can find a lot more about here at the links that I provide here. Um, but S11 is return loss, S21 is forward gain. And we talked about reflection coefficient. Uh, it's, again, about how much of the wave is reflected. And if you know the SWR, you can calculate the reflection coefficient uh, using SWR minus 1 over SWR plus 1. Now we're getting into engineering. You can use this number to uh, do certain calculations. We're not going to go any further <laughs> than letting you know it exists. So um, RF ammeters, remember we talked about ammeters and you put them in series, uh, uh, voltmeters you put in parallel. Well, on some broadcast AM transmitters, they've got a meter that looks very much like this, and it's in series with the radio frequency output of that transmitter, and it directly measures the amount of radio frequency current that that transmitter is putting out. And so... Some FCC broadcast licenses actually may specify not the transmitter's output power, but the transmitter's output current. And that's what the broadcast engineers have to make sure that the transmitter is set up properly so that the output current doesn't exceed the rated value. More current means more power going to the antenna. Less current means less power going to the antenna. That's kind of obvious. MFJ... 
uh, makes one that you can actually clamp around uh, a transmission line and measure the current. The problem is you're very close to a transmission line here, and if you're going to hold it like this, uh, there's high zap potential. So you need to be very careful if you're going to use one of these direct reading clamp-on RF current meters. Um, wow. Not so popular, but they do exist. So um, if you have a mismatched transmission line, you have a source that has one impedance and you have a load that is of a different impedance, well, you're going to have the incident signal, the, the signal coming from the transmitter going this way, and the reflected signal coming back this way. We know that the standing wave ratio is going to be greater than one to one. One way, we talked about the, the various matching networks before, but one other way that you can match is something called a transmission line transformer. So notice here we have a 50 ohm output impedance from our transmitter. And here we have an antenna, let's say, that has a, a, res, a radiation resistance of 100 ohms. Well, that's going to represent 100 divided by 50, a 2 to 1 standing wave ratio. And we want it to get down to 1 to 1. Well, what we can do is that the frequency that we're going to operate, it's only good for one frequency. Um, we can use a section of transmission line that is exactly a quarter of a, a <clears throat> wavelength long and, excuse me, what we do is we take the mean between these. So the, the number that sits between 100 ohms and 50 ohms is 75 ohms. So we could use a 75 ohm transmission line cut to exactly a quarter of a wavelength long at the frequency of interest and we'll put 50 ohms out here it'll be transformed to 100 ohms out here. This is called a transmission line transformer. Moving right along there's a lot of stuff we're covering here and uh, velocity factor. Radio travels at the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, through a bare wire or open wire transmission line, it travels almost as fast. But it's slowed down if you use insulated wire. So I get asked this question, Gary, I want to build a dipole antenna. Can I use insulated wire? You can, but your antenna is going to be slightly shorter, 4%, 5%, than the calculations the, the formulas say, because the formulas are all based on uninsulated wire. It's the plastic on the wire that slows down the radio wave ever so slightly. Coaxial cable dielectric slows it even more uh, because there's much more plastic uh, around the center conductor of coaxial cable. So this is velocity factor. So how fast is a radio wave traveling compared to the speed of light? And it's expressed of the velocity of the wave in the line divided by the velocity of light in a vacuum. And it's determined by the plastics, the dielectric materials used in the cable. The denser the plastic, think polyethylene, it slows down more. So remember that cables make waves slow if they're insulated. So you can buy different kinds of coaxial cable. Um, and one type uses a solid dielectric. Here's the center conductor. Here's the dielectric that goes around the center conductor. This is plastic. And then there's a, a braid that goes around that. So this is coaxial cable. And then there's an insulating jacket that goes around the whole thing. So foam dielectric. Here's foam dielectric. And here's solid plastic. And if you, you know, push in on this, this will deform because it's just foam, uh, like styrofoam. Whereas this is hard plastic. You can't push in on that. The velocity factor of foam is 78%. Radio waves travel only 78% of the speed of light through foam cable. Whereas solid, it only travels 0.66 or 66%. So the solid dielectric um, actually slows the waves down. So foam dielectric um, has 
some negatives. Um, it has a, the higher velocity factor, but it has some negatives. It has a lower safe operating voltage. That's because that's just foam, uh, and there's air gaps in there, and a voltage can arc through. Foam dielectric has lower loss per unit of length. Well, that's good. And foam dielectric has higher velocity factor. That may or may not be good. It just all depends. So on tables for cables, for transmission lines, you'll see the loss at various frequencies per 100 foot. It'll also show you the velocity factor of that kind of cable. So solid polyethylene, remember, is 0.66. Whereas open wire transmission line, that's almost 1. So that's almost 100%. This is also covered in Table 9.1 in your book. So let's see if we can do some calculations here. What is the approximate physical length of a solid polyethylene dielectric coax transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long um, at 14.1 megahertz? Well, how do we solve this? Well, let's go ahead and, and try to do this. So let's come back over here to the uh, calculator cam, if we could. So we're at, let me just make sure I'm still on the screen here, 14.1 megahertz, all right? And we want to know um, something that's one quarter of a wavelength. Well, let, let's start with um, half wavelength. We know that 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz will give you an answer for a half wave dipole in feet. So let's take our calculator. Clear it out. 468 divided by 14.1. 14.1 equals, so that's 33.19 feet. All right, that's for a half wavelength. Quarter wavelength is going to be half of that. So 33.19 9 times 0 0.5, 16.6 feet, okay? Now, we're using solid polyethylene, which has um, a velocity factor, do you remember? 0 0.66. So, we're going to actually shorten this length by 66%, or take it down to 66%. So let's 16, let me come back into the screen here, 16.6 times 0.66 equals 10.96 feet. Wow. Now, you could also do it in meters. Let's do that. Remember the meter band, it's 300 divided by uh, the frequency in megahertz, 14.1. So let's, let's do this, because I'd forgotten the answer is in meters. <laughs> 300 divided by 14.1. So that's, that's the full wavelength. 21.28 meters. Let's take 21.28 times 0.25 that to get down to a, a quarter wavelength. That's 5.32 meters. And let's take 5.32 times 0.66. Oh. That's 3.51 meters, which just happens to be the right answer. 3.5 <laughs> meters. So we did it in feet, and we did it in meters. So e either way, you can, you can do it in either one, but the, the answer um, is going to be uh, for the test in meters. So keep that in mind. You can probably remember 3.5. You'll probably see this sign as you're taking your test, I hope, anyway. All right. 
How many of you got a chance to watch Standing Up for Standing Waves? I sent you a link uh, with this video. If you, if you haven't watched it, I, I really strongly urge you to watch it. Really some great information uh, in this uh, video. And two things uh, that really stand out and that you want to know is that a half wavelength line is an impedance repeater. He says this and he proves it. So that if you have an impedance at one end of a half wavelength line, it's going to be the same when you measure it over here. And in fact, St. Ham's will do this. They'll make uh, half wavelength lines or multiples of half wavelength for like the 20 meter band. And they'll keep that. Um, and um, that's their reference cable. So if they put up a 20 meter antenna before they put up their random uh, feed line, they'll use this calibrated feed line, one that they know uh, is a multiple of a half wavelength, and then they'll know if they make a measurement at the bottom of this cable, that's what the, the antenna is actually reading. So a half wavelength line is an impedance repeater. So a half wavelength, full wavelength, one and a half, two, uh, all of that. A half wavelength line is an impedance repeater. A quarter wavelength line is an impedance inverter. And by that we mean if you have a low impedance at one end of a quarter wavelength line, it's going to be a high impedance at the other end. And for that, for my proof, I would like you to consider the case of the half wave dipole. We, so here we have a half wave dipole. So each one of these is going to be a quarter wavelength and a quarter wavelength. We know it's a low impedance point at the center. Quarter wavelength away, it's going to be a high impedance point. Remember I asked you uh, last week to start considering impedance as the ratio of voltage to current. Well here the voltage is very high but the current is very low. Here the current is very high but the voltage is very low. So here's low impedance at one end of a quarter wavelength line and high impedance at the other. So a quarter wavelength line is an impedance inverter. There are these tables also in your book uh, that have some interesting characteristics. Um, if you go to uh, the, the quarter wavelength, for example, uh, you'll see that it is an impedance inverter. Um, but if you go to a, a section less, and these are open lines, they're not terminated at the end, not shorted out at the end. If you have an eighth wavelength long open line, it actually acts as a capacitor. You can make capacitors this way. And they're fairly high voltage capacitors. So in a pinch, if you need to match something up, you can use lengths of coax to substitute uh, for capacitors or inductors. In the case of shorted lines, a 1 8 wave shorted line acts as an inductance. And so um, you can use this in a circuit where you need an inductor that you don't happen to have on the shelf. Sometimes emergency repairs can be made this way. So two things to remember. A 1 8 wave open line appears as a capacitance. A 1 8 wave shorted line appears as an inductor. And then conversely, if you go out a longer distance, a 3 8 wave open line appears as an inductance, and a 3 8 wave shorted line appears as a capacitance. So um, I know that's a lot to take in, but look back over that table, and it might start to make sense. I know the first time you see that, you're going, what the heck are they talking about here? But um, transmission line um, sections uh, can be made to uh, serve as capacitors or inductors. So here we have an interesting thing, um, sometimes known as an alignment chart. Sometimes manufacturers used to give these out for their uh, technicians uh, to do calculations. This is called a nomogram. Uh, and um, it can be used to find an unknown value if you've got three things here. If you know two of the three by you know, plotting where one value is on one and the other value is on the other and drawing a line 
you can find out what the unknown. So this is a nomogram for Ohm's law. So you don't have to get a calculator out. You could actually do this graphically. Be happy that you don't have to take your um, tests now or tests um, back when I took them back in the 60s. We used slide rules instead of calculators because a slide rule is a big nomogram. Uh, and it's a way that you can do calculations uh, without um, uh, actually uh, punching any buttons. All right. I'm so proud of you that you've made it through to this point. Uh, and Ben, if you would come back to me, because now we are going to um, enter you into the Amateur Radio Secret Society. I'm not kidding. This is, this is big stuff. In fact, I have to I have to ro I have to robe up for this. Oh yeah, very appropriate. Do you have your magic slippers on, Gary? I'll okay. never tell. Yeah. All right, are we ready? So come yeah. on back. Here we are. We're going to introduce you something top secret. This is a very secret society. I'm about to bring you into here. You're going to gain some understanding. Don't tell anybody. The mother of all nomograms is the Smith chart. No. The Smith chart is a nomogram. Uh, and it was designed by Philip Hagar Smith. And a quote from him, From the time I could operate a slide rule, I've been interested in graphical representations of mathematical relationships. So he's the guy that put this all together. And you can check out his uh, Wikipedia entry, fascinating. So a Smith chart is all about impedance and standing wave ratio. Um, and uh, in your book, there's a chart. I'll also, um, in the handouts, have a link to a PDF of just a single chart so you can mark it up, uh, and try to do some calculations. Smith chart is made up of resistance circles and reactance arcs and around the edge is uh, measuring fractions of transmission line electrical wavelength around the edge. Now when I first saw this Smith chart and, and the way it looked I was reminded of one of my favorite TV shows back in the day. Anybody ever <laughs> watch Time Tunnel? No. That's, there's, there's a Smith chart for you. So wow. resistance circles. So in the middle of the Smith chart is a straight line. This is known as the resistance axis. And at the left-hand side, it's a short circuit, or zero ohms. On the right-hand side, it's if infinity. Remember the time tunnel? You're looking into infinity? Well, that's infinity right there. And any point along one of these circles has the same resistance. It could be an antenna, it could be radiation resistance. The center of the Smith chart, marked by 1.0, that's called the prime center. So this is the resistance axis. The resistance axis is a straight line, and these are known as resistance circles. And anything that is along one of these circles has the same resistance. More to come. Then reactance arcs. So the outer ring is known as the reactance axis. And anything above the resistance line is inductive reactance. The sign of the uh, reactance is positive. Anything below the resistance line is negative. That's capacitance. So anything along these arcs is going to have the same reactance. Capacitive reactance along the bottom inductive reactants along the top. And the outer circle out here is known as the reactance axis. So the resistance axis is here and the reactance axis is on the out, outer circle here. We talked about the prime center, that's the 1.0 in the center of the thing. We don't usually deal in one ohm uh, circuits. We deal in 50 ohm circuits. 
So you can normalize this chart to 50 ohms by multiplying all of the values you see on the chart by 50. So if we normalize this chart to 50 times 1, this point becomes 50 ohms. And since there's no inductive reactance or capacitive reactance, right, this, this is 50 ohms pure resistance. All of the other points are multiplied the same. So 0 0.5 times 50, this would be 25 ohms. 0 0.2 times 50, down to short circuit. And remember, infinity is over here. So normalizing a Smith chart is taking the 1.0 prime center and multiplying it by whatever impedance you want to work in. It could be other than 50 ohms. but And you can sometimes find Smith charts still with them printed uh, as 50 ohm in the center, although they're kind of rare. An interesting thing about uh, the Smith chart is that if you draw a circle around a point, this is known as an SWR circle, or standing wave ratio, and anything on this circle will have the same standing wave. Here it's going to be in inductive reactance, here it's going to be capacitive reactance, but it's still going to be an SWR of 2. Anything within this circle is going to be an SWR of less than 2, which is what most transmitters want to see. So a Smith chart is really good about impedance matching and finding what you need to do. On the outer ring, it is useful to calculate the impedance along a transmission line because it talks about wavelengths toward the load, like the antenna, or toward the generator, the transmitter. And why in heaven's name do we want to use the Smith chart? Well, it's a graphical way to do impedance matching. And normally impedance matching is uh, like an L network has two components. Well, if this is your starting impedance and you want to get to the prime center, by adding one component in series and another component in parallel, you move along these axes and get to the desired location. So that's what a Smith chart is all about. You don't need to use it on the test, but you need to know about it on the test. Do you prefer computers like I do? Well, boy, have I got something for you. SimSmith. This is free Windows software that puts a dynamic Smith chart on your computer. And it's written by Ward Harriman. Uh, you can find it, uh, Groups I.O. on SimSmith here, uh, and you can find the software here at this URL. You can download it. It's a Windows software for free. It's really complex, but very powerful. Well, how do you figure out how to use it? I want to acknowledge another YouTuber, Larry Benko, W0QE. He has a YouTube channel uh, using his call sign. And he talks about SimSmith and the Nano VNA, both. Uh, so um, very, very powerful information here uh, that you can use at your station. So I want to thank you. You are now ordained into the secret society of the Smith chart. Very few people have even seen a Smith chart, let alone understand what it's all about. And so now I'm proud to say it's time for a five-minute break. Let's take an intermission, and we'll come back and answer some questions.
Well, welcome back. Got the hat off. It's getting too hot up here. We <laughs> got so, too much equipment in this room. My dogs are up here as well. They wanted to add to the heat uh, tonight, uh, but they know that they get treats after uh, we're all done. So uh, they're kind of pushing for that. But uh, anyway, let's see what we can do with some questions uh, from the material that we uh, just uh, talked about. Uh, and uh, then I think one more section after that. Oops, and uh, my little HDMI splitter's going black. Can't do that. All right, so which of the following is an advantage of using an antenna analyzer compared to an SWR bridge? Go ahead and unmute if you would. Bravo. I heard bravo, and that is correct. Antenna analyzers do not need an external RF source. They have one built right in. So which of the following measures SWR? Delta. I hear Delta. That antenna analyzer again, indeed. So how should an antenna analyzer be connected when measuring antenna resonance and feed point impedance? Delta. Delta again, yep. Connect uh, the, uh, <coughs> directly to the antenna feed line to the analyzer's connector. All right. Which S parameter is equivalent to forward gain? Charlie. 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 S21, throwing that pass. Yes, indeed. And which S parameter represents input port return loss? Alpha. S11. Alpha. Yep, 10 below that. Yes, indeed. And what three test loads are used to calibrate an RF vector network analyzer? Bravo. A short circuit, an open circuit, and the, the impedance that you want to work in, which normally is 50 ohms. You can calibrate them to other values, though, just like you can normalize a Smith chart to a different value. But 50 ohms is, is the right one. So how much power is being absorbed by the load when a directional watt meter connected between a transmitter and terminating load reads 100 watts forward and 25 watts reflected. Delta. 100 minus 25 is 75. And what do the subscripts of S parameters represent? Alpha. It's the port or ports at which the measurements are being made. And what is indicated if the current reading of an RF ammeter placed in series with the antenna feed line of a transmitter increases as the transmitter is tuned to resonance? <coughs> delta. It's pretty simple. There's more power going to the antenna. Yep, delta indeed. And which of the following can be measured with a vector network analyzer? All of them. D. Yeah, I listed them. I, we didn't talk directly, but yes, indeed, all of those are possible. Which of these feed line impedances would be suitable for constructing a quarter wave Q section for matching a 100 ohm loop to a 50 ohm feed line? Okay, Q section is also known as a transmission line transformer. Charlie. So you take the mean between the two. What's between them? 75 ohms. And that would be the right one. All right, what parameter describes the interactions at the load end of a mismatched transmission line? Alpha. Okay, I could see how you could get to alpha, but what they're searching for is something that directly relates to mismatch, uh, and that's the reflection coefficient, okay. the, having to do with the reflections. Which of these choices is an effective way to match an antenna with a 100 ohm feed point impedance to a 50 ohm coaxial cable feed line? Charlie. Again, this is our transmission line transformer. So, yep, a quarter wavelength piece of 75 ohm coaxial cable between 100 and, and 50. Yep. 
And what is the velocity factor of a transmission line? Delta? Delta is right. The velocity of the wave in the transmission line divided by the velocity of light in a vacuum. So if it was traveling at, at full speed with, without any degradation, it would be 1 over 1 or, or 1. So the velocity factor would be 1. But in polyethylene, for example, it's 0.66 almost halved by all that plastic. And which of the following has the biggest effect on the velocity factor of a transmission line? Charlie. Yep, the plastics, the dielectric materials used in the line. And why is the physical length of a coaxial cable transmission line shorter than its electrical length? Delta? Delta. Electrical signals move more slowly in coaxial cable than in the air, yep. And what impedance does a half-wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? A half-wavelength line is a... an impedance repeater. So if it's shorted at the far end. Very low impedance. They don't say shorted, they just say very low impedance. So yeah, if it's shorted at the far end, it's going to be all close to shorted at, at your end. Yes, indeed. And what is the approximate physical length of a solid polyethylene dielectric coaxial transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz? Remember the sign? <laughs> Delta. D. David. Delta. 3.5. And <laughs> what is the approximate physical length of an air insulated parallel conductor transmission line that is electrically a half wavelength long at 14.10? So let's talk this through. It's parallel conductor transmission line. There's no plastics involved at all. So the all velocity right. factor of parallel transmission line is close to 1. All right. So 14.1, what band is that? 15 meters. No. Oh, 20 meters. 20, 20 meters. meters. 20 meters. So a half wavelength approximately, it would be around 10 meters. Right. That's all you need to know. Because the velocity factor of parallel conductor transmission line is close to 1. So how does letter line compared to small diameter coaxial cables such as RG58 at 50 megahertz. Much lower loss alpha. Yep, much lower loss, yes indeed. And which of the following is a significant difference between foam dielectric and solid dielectric cable? Delta. Yep, all of those. And what is the approximate physical length of foam polyethylene dielectric coaxial cable electrically quarter wavelength long at 7.2 megahertz? A quarter wave of 25, 1.3. Bravo. So, a, a beta? So, what band, what band is this? It's, oh, 40 meters. 40 Alpha. meters. So, quarter wavelength is going to be about? N. And it's going to be somewhat shorter than 10 because of the velocity factor. So, you, so you can go close to 10, it's 8.3. So we did that by approximation. You can also do it by knowing what the velocity factor of um, foam coax is and, and do the math. But th this is good enough. So what impedance does a 1 8 wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted? Just the opposite. Well, these were the special case in that table that you can make components out of transmission line. Right. So one eighth wavelength transmission line shorted is C. Charles C. An inductive reactance. Yep, you can make an inductor. And what impedance does a one eighth wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? 
Just the opposite. Capacitive reactance. Exactly. You can make a capacitor. And what impedance does a quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? A quarter wavelength transmission line is an impedance inverter. Oh, so if it's open at, open at the far end, it's going to be a very low impedance at the other. Yep. And what impedance does a quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? <laughs> high impedance. A high impedance. You got it. See, you got this. And which of the following can be calculated using a Smith chart? Alpha. Alpha. Yep, the impedance along a transmission line. And what type of coordinate system is used in a Smith chart? Resistance circles, reactance arcs. Yes, indeedy. And which of the following is often determined using a Smith chart? Charlie. Charlie. Impedance and SWR values in a transmission line. And what are the two families of circles and arcs that make up a Smith chart? Resistance and reactance. Correct. All right, let's take a look at the Smith chart. Uh, look closely. What is the name for the large outer circle on which the reactance arc terminate, the arcs terminate? The large outer circle. Reactance, Bravo. reactance. Bravo. Bravo. The reactance axis is correct. And on the Smith chart, what is the only straight line? Delta. The resistance. resistance axis, indeed. And what is the process of normalization with regard to a Smith chart? Hmm. Bravo? No. C, Charles? Well, okay, I can see where you could see Bravo as being, but remember what point we're dealing with on the resistance axis. We're dealing with the, posi the point one, point zero, the point one. That's known as the prime center. It's the center of the chart. So it's reassigning impedance values with regard to the prime center. Now the prime center wow. is sitting on the resistance axis, so you're, you're correct. Um, but, but it's prime center that we're dealing with. So what third family of circles is often added to a Smith chart during the process of solving problems? Alpha. Your, trans your, your transmitter wants to have an SWR less than 2 to 1, so we add standing wave ratio circles to see what's going on. Yep. And what do the arcs on a Smith chart represent? Constant reactance. Delta. Yep, constant reactance. And how are the wavelength scales on a Smith chart calibrated? Oh, God. If you look at the outer ring of the chart. Oh, electrical wavelength. Yep. Fractions of transmission line electrical wavelength. We're nearly done. You're doing great. We want to talk about antenna design just a little bit. Um, just want to make you aware of some things. So you can, you can do it, you know, cut and paste 468 divided by, you know, the frequency. But there's now antenna modeling. That used to be, you know, something you required a Cray computer to do, but now you can do it on your home PC. The goal is to predict an antenna's performance before you build it, and you can try different options and see what happens on the computer. And you can get uh, readouts of uh, uh, different things, the input impedance, the uh, pattern of the antenna, etc. So you use software, and probably the most um, Popular and um, most reliable uh, used in amateur radio is uh, EasyNEC uh, by, um, I think it's Ray Llewellyn, Roy Llewellyn, I can't remember his first name, W7EL. And you'll see him at some of the larger ham fests selling his software on a CD, or I think you can download it now too. Um, so 
Computer modeling software is based on something called the Numerical Electromagnetics Code, NEC. It uses method of moments analysis. And this is where uniform currents in an individual antenna or wire segments are modeled. So you have different segments with uniform currents in each. So the EasyNEC software, you can download it at easynec.com. It's not free. It's about $100, but um, this is the, the one that the, the people use most readily. Now, if you just want to get your feet wet, there is a free alternative. It's called Monogal, uh, and it's uh, by some German and Japanese hams, and you can find it here at this uh, URL. This is free, and a lot of people use it and uh, find uh, that it works uh, quite well for them. So here's some detailed explanations of method of moments. Um, I'm not even going to read it. <laughs> you can read it if you want. Uh, but it deals with the mean and variance and standard deviation and skewness and something called kurtosis. I thought that was bad breath, but maybe that's different. Okay, anyway. <laughs> method of moments, or MOM, uh, is a me method of estimating parameters um, using probability distribution. So some software quirks from the modeling software. If you go outside the model frequency range, the antenna gain is going to definitely be different um, because you would expect it to. And also, using less than the recommended 10 segments modeled per half wavelength may give you a wrong feed point impedance. So these are things that you just have to learn from experience in using the software. But what can you learn? You can learn the, the SWR versus frequency. You can see polar plots of the far field elevation and azimuth patterns. And you can see the estimated antenna's front gain and front to back ratio. And by playing with various components, you'll see the gain change and the front to back ratio. If you optimize, by the way, for maximum gain, you will lose front to back ratio. So everything is a trade off. Oh, last questions. So what type of computer program technique is commonly used for modeling antennas? Bravo. <coughs> Bravo. MOM, method of moments. And what is the principal method of moments analysis? Alpha? Yes, it's a series of segments and we have a uniform value of current in each. Um, there's series circuits, so they're going to have a uniform value of current. So, um, yep, this you could get confused on this one, but this is the right one, uniform value of current. What is the disadvantage of decreasing the number of wire segments in an antenna model below the 10 segments per half wavelength? Early? The feed point impedance will likely be incorrect. And what usually occurs if a Yagi antenna is designed solely for maximum forward gain? Alpha. No, not alpha. Theta. Bravo. Front to, the front bravo. to back ratio will decrease or completely go away. So you don't want that. So, whoa, look at that. We made it through chapter nine. Very happy yeah. about that. Did a great job, guys. Two thumbs up. Uh, yeah. Dave, let's turn it over to you. Uh, turn his mic on, if you would. Um, and what's going on next week, Dave? Well, next week, we're going to do all of Chapter 10, which is on propagation. It's a very practical chapter, especially if you're going to be chasing DX, long-distance communications. And uh, it's going to cover HF as well as UHF, VHF and VHF and above. Some hams specialize in those uh, higher frequencies, but you'll find this to be a very practical chapter in your ham radio career. So we'll read all of the chapter for next week and do all the pool questions. All right. Thank you, Dave. Any questions from the class before we uh, get out a half an hour early? All right. Thank no, I want to say congratulations on your 10,000. Thank you. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 10,000. Wow. Thanks to everyone who made it possible.
Uh, appreciate it. Can we have one of the dogs? Can we see one of the pups? They're, they're, they too, they're, too, they're too big. They don't jump up. So, oh. um, yeah, I promised you a picture, didn't I? I'll send you a photo. <laughs> oh. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. 73 will.